hello, hello. Let's see. There we go. Let's set that down. This is a reading of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. It's going to be going here. My, this is my favorite toy. My, it's, a, it's a facsimile of the folio. I love reading from it. Welcome, welcome. I've got a link. Ooh, hearts, thank you. <laughs> Sports picks and Grady Haynes. Welcome, Rajatua Mala. Okay. Start in a just a minute, see if anybody else comes in. Here we go. Okay, much ado about nothing. I'm just gonna start at the beginning and we'll see how far we get. Enter Leonato, governor of Messina, Inogen his wife, Hero his daughter, and Beatrice his niece, along with a messenger. I learn in this letter that Don Pedro of Aragon comes this night to Messina. He is very nearby. He was not three leagues off when I left him. How many gentlemen have you lost in this action? But few of any sort, and none of name. A victory is twice itself when the achiever brings home full numbers. I find here that Don Peter has bestowed much honor on a young Florentine called Claudio. Much deserved on his part and equally remembered by Don Pedro, he hath borne himself beyond the promise of his age, doing in the figure of a lamb the feats of a lion. He hath indeed better bettered expectation than you must expect of me to tell you how. He hath an uncle here in Messina, will be much glad of it. I have already delivered him letters, and there appears much joy in him, even so much that joy could not show itself modest enough without a badge of bitterness. Did he break out into tears? In great measure. <laughs> a kind overflow of kindness. There are no faces truer than those that are so washed. How much better is it to weep at joy than to joy at weeping? I pray you, is Signor Montanto returned from the wars or no? I know none of that name, lady. There was none such in the army of any sort. What is he that you ask for, niece? My cousin means Signor Benedict of Padua. Oh, he's returned, and as pleasant as ever he was. He set up his bills here in Messina and challenged Cupid at the flight. And my uncle, fool reading the challenge, subscribed for Cupid and challenged him at the Burbo. I pray you, how many hath he killed and eaten in these wars? But how many hath he killed? For indeed I promise to eat all of his killing. Faith, niece, you tax Signor Benedict too much, but he'll be meet with you, I doubt it not. He hath done good service, lady, in these wars. You had musty victual, and he hath hoped to ease it. He's a very valiant trencher man. He hath an excellent stomach. And a good soldier to a lady. And a good soldier to a lady. But what is he to a lord? A lord to a lord? <laughs> a man to a man, stuffed with all honorable virtues. It is so indeed. He is no less than a stuffed man, but for the stuffing, well, we are all mortal. You must not, sir, mistake my niece. There is a kind of merry war betwixt Signor Benedict and her. They never meet, but there's a skirmish of wit between them. Alas, he gets nothing by that. In our last conflict, four of his five wits went halting off, and now is the whole man governed with one. So that if he have wit enough to keep himself warm, let him bear it for a difference between himself and his horse. For it is all the wealth that he hath left to be known a reasonable creature. Who is his companion now? He hath every month a new sworn brother. Is't possible? Very easily possible. He wears his faith, but as the fashion of his hat, it ever changes with the next block. I see. Lady, the gentleman is not in your books. No, and he were. I would burn my study. But I pray you, who is his companion? Is there no young square now that will make a voyage with him to the devil? He is most in the company of the right noble Claudio. Oh, Lord! He will hang upon him like a disease! He is sooner 
caught with the pestilence, and the taker runs presently mad. God help the noble Claudio, that he have caught the Benedict. It will cost him a thousand pounds ere he be cured. I will hold friends with you, lady. Do, good friend. You'll ne'er run mad, niece. No, not till a hot January. Don Pedro is approaching. Enter Don Pedro, Claudio, Benedict, Balthazar, and John. Good Signor Leonato, you are come to meet your trouble. The fashion of the world is to, is to avoid cost, and you encounter it. Never came trouble to my house in the likeness of your grace. For trouble being gone, comfort should remain. But when you depart from me, sorrow abides, and happiness takes his leave. You embrace your charge too willingly. I think this is your daughter? Her mother hath many times told me so. Were you in doubt that you asked her? Signor Benedict, no, for then you were a child. You have it full, Benedict. We may guess by this what, are, what you are, being a man, truly the lady's father herself. Be happy, lady, for you are like an honorable, an honorable father. If Signor Leonato be her father, she would not have his head on her shoulders for all Messina, as like him as she is. I wonder that you will still be talking, Signor Benedict. Nobody marks you. What? My dear Lady Disdain, are you let yet living? Is it possible Disdain should die when she hath such meat food to feed it as Signor Benedict? Courtesy itself must convert to Disdain if you come in her presence. Then is courtesy a turncoat? But it is certain I am loved of all ladies, only you excepted, and I would, I could find in my heart that I had not a hard heart, for truly I love none. A dear happiness to women. They would else have been troubled with a pernicious suitor. I thank God in my cold blood I am of your humor for that. I would rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. God keep your ladyship still in that mind. So some gentleman or other shall escape a predestinate, scratched face. Scratching could not make it worse than twere such a face as yours were. Well, you are a rare parrot teacher. A bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. I would my horse had the speed of your tongue, and so good a continuer, but keep your way at God's name. I have done. You always end with a jade's trick. I know you of old. This is the sum of all. Leonato, Signor Claudio and Signor Benedict, my dear friend Leonato, hath invited you all. I tell him we shall stay here at the least a month, and he heartily prays some occasion may detain us longer. I dare sway he is no hypocrite, but prays from his heart. If you swear, my lord, you shall not be forsworn. Let me bid you welcome, my lord. Being reconciled to the prince, your brother, I owe you all duty. I thank you. I am not of many words, but I thank you. Please it, Your Grace. Lead on. Your hand, Leonardo. We will go together. Benedict and Claudio remain while everyone else exits. Benedict, didst thou note the daughter of Signor Leonardo? I noted her not, but I looked on her. Is she not a modest young lady? Do you question me as an honest man should do, for my simple, true judgment, or would you have me speak after my custom, as being a professed tyrant to their sex? No, I pray thee, speak in sober judgment. Why, faith, methinks she's too low for a high praise, too brown for a fair praise, and too little for a great praise. Only this one commendation I can afford her that were she other than she is, she were unhandsome, and be no other but as she is. I do not like her. Thou thinks I am in sport. I pray thee, tell me truly how thou likest her. Would you buy her that you inquire after her? Can the world buy such a jewel? Yea, and a case to put it into, but speak you this with a sad brow. Or do you play the flowy... The flouting Jack, to tell us Cupid is a good hair finder, and Vulcan a rare carpenter. Come, in what key shall a man take you to go in the song? In mine eye, she is the sweetest lady that ever I looked on. 
I can see yet without spectacles, and I see no such matter. There's her cousin, and she were not possessed with a fury, exceeds her as, as much in beauty as the first of May doth the last of December. But I hope you have no intent to turn husband, have you? I would scarce trust myself, though I had sworn the contrary, if Hero would be my wife. It's come to this! In faith, hath not the world one man, but he will wear his cap with supposition. Shall I ne'er see a bachelor of threescore year again? Go to your faith, and thou wilt needs thrust thy neck into a yoke, wear the print of it, and sigh away Sundays. Look, Don Pedro is returned to seek you. What secret hath held you here that you followed not to Leonato's? I would your grace would constrain me to tell. I charge thee on thy allegiance. You hear, Count Claudio. I can be secret as a dumb man. I would have you think so, but on my allegiance, mark, mark you this, on my allegiance, he is in love. With who? Now, this is your grace's part. Mark how short his answer is. With Hero, Leonatus' short daughter. If this were so, so were it uttered. Like the old tale, my lord, it is not so, nor t'was not so, but indeed, God forbid, it should be so. If my passion change not shortly, God forbid it should be otherwise. Amen, if you love her, for the lady is very well worthy. You speak this to fetch me in, my lord. By my troth, I speak my thought. And in faith, my lord, I spoke mine. And by my two faiths and troths, my lord, I speak mine. That I love her, I know, I feel. That she is worthy, I know. That I neither feel how she should be loved, nor know how she should be worthy, is the opinion that fire cannot melt out of me. I will die in it at the stake. Thou wast ever an obstinate heretic in the despite of beauty, and never could maintain his part but in the force of his will. That a woman conceived me, I thank her. That she brought me up, I likewise give her most humble thanks. But that I will have a rechate winded in my forehead, or hang my bugle in an invisible baldric, all women shall pardon me, because I will not do them the wrong to mistrust any. I will do myself the right to trust none, and the fine is, for the which I may go the finer, I will live a bachelor. I shall see thee, ere I die, look pale with love, with anger, with sickness, or with hunger, my lord, not with love. Prove that ever I lose more blood that with love than I will get again with drinking. Pick out mine eyes with a ballot maker's pen and hang me up at the door of a brothel house to the sign of blind Cupid. Well, if ever thou dost fall from this faith, thou wilt prove a notable argument. If I do, hang me in a bottle like a cat and shoot at me. And he that hits me, let him be clapped on the shoulder and called Adam. Well. As time shall try, in time the savage bull doth bear the yoke. The savage bull may, but if ever the sensible Benedict bear it, pluck off the bull's horns, and set them in my forehead, and let me be wildly painted, and in such great letters as they write, Here is good horse to hire. Let them signify under my sign, Here you may see Benedict, the married man. If this should ever happen, thou wouldst be horn mad. Nay, if Cupid had not spent all his, oh, I'm not sure what that word is, all his, oh, all his quiver in Venice, thou wilt quake for this shortly. I looked for an earthquake too, then. Well, you will temporize with the hours. In the meantime, good Signor Benedict, repair to Leonardo's. Commend me to him, and tell him I will not, I will not fail him at supper, for indeed he hath made great preparation. I have almost matter enough in me for such an embassage, and so... I commit, to, I commit you to the tuition of God from my house if I had it. The 6th of July, your loving friend, Benedict. Nay, mock not, mock not. The body of your discourse is sometime guarded with fragments, and the guards are but lightly based and on neither. Ere you flout old ends any further, examine your conscience. And so I leave you. My liege, uh, exit Benedict. My liege, your highness now may do me good. My love is thine to teach. Teach it but how, and thou shalt see how apt it is to learn. Any hard lesson that may do thee good. 
Hath Leonato any son, my lord? No child but Hero. She's his only heir. Dost thou affect her, Claudio? Oh, my lord, when you went onward on this ended action, I looked upon her with a soldier's eye that liked, but had a rougher task in hand than to drive liking to the name of love. But now I am returned, and that war thoughts have left their places vacant. In their rooms come thronging soft and delicate desires, all prompting me how fair young hero is, saying I liked her ere I went to wars. Thou wilt be like a lover presently, and tire the hearer with a book of words. If thou dost love fair hero, cherish it, and I will break with her. Waste not to this end that thou began'st to twist so fine a story. How sweetly do you minister to love, that no love's grief by his complexion, but left my liking might to so, might to so dame, might to sudden seem, I would have solved it with a longer treatise. What need bridge much broader than the flood? The fairest grant is the necessity. Look what will serve, is fit. Tis once thou lovest, and I will fit thee with the remedy. I know we shall have reveling tonight. I will assume thy part in some disguise, and tell fair hero I am Claudio. And in her bosom I'll unclasp my heart, and take her hearing prisoner with the force and strong encounter of my amorous tale. Then after to her father will I break, and the conclusion is, she shall be thine. In practice, let us put it presently. Enter Leonato, and an old man, brother to Leonato. How now, brother? Where is my cousin, your son? Hath he provided this music? He is very busy about it. But, brother, I can tell you news that you yet dream that not of. Are they good? As the event stamps them, but they have a good cover. They shoe well outward. The prince and Count Claudio walking in a thick pleached alley in my orchard were thus overheard by a man of mine. The prince discovered to Claudio that he loved my niece, your daughter, and meant to acknowledge it this night in a dance. And if he found her accordant, he meant to take the present time by the top and instantly break with you of it. Had the fellow any wit that told you this? A good, sharp fellow. I will send for him and question him yourself. No, no. We will hold it as a dream till it appear itself. But I will acquaint my daughter withal that she may be the better prepared for an answer if peradventure this be, tr if peradventure this be true. Go you and tell her of it. Cousins, you know what you have to do. I cry your mercy, friend. Go you with me and I will use your skill. Good cousin, have a care this busy time. Exit. Enter Sir John and Conrad, his companion. What the good year, my lord? Why are you thus out of measure sad? There is no measure in the occasion that breeds, therefore the sadness is without limit. You should have reason, you should hear reason. And when I have heard it, what blessing bringeth it? If not a present remedy, yet a patient sufferance. I wonder that thou, being as thou sayest thou art, born under Saturn, goest about to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause, and smile at no man's jests. Eat when I have stomach, and wait for no man's leisure. Sleep when I am drowsy, and tend on no man's business. Laugh when I am merry, and claw no man in his humor. Yea, but you must not make that the full show of this till you may do it without controlment. You have of late stood out against your brother, and he hath taken you newly into his grace, where it is impossible you should take root but by the fair weather that you make yourself. It is needful that you frame the season for your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. 
In this, though I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man, it must not be denied, but I am a plain-dealing villain. I am trusted with a muscle and am franchised with a clog. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am and seek not to alter me. Can you make no use of your discontent? I will make all use of it, for I use it only. Who comes here? What news, Baraccio? Enter Baraccio. I came yonder from a great supper. The prince, your brother, is royally entertained by Leonato, and I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. Will it serve for any model to build mischief on? What is he for a fool that betroths himself to unquiet this? Mary, it is your brother's right hand. Who? The most exquisite Claudio. Even he. A proper squire. And who? And who? Which way looks he? Mary, on hero, the daughter and heir of Leonato. A very forward march, chick. How came you to this? Being entertained for a perfumer, as I was smoking a musty room, comes to me, the prince and Claudio, hand in hand in sad conference. I whipped behind the heiress, and there heard it agreed upon that the prince should woo Hero for himself, and, having obtained her, give her to Count Claudio. Come, come, let us thither. This may prove food to my displeasure. That young startup hath all the glory of my overthrow. If I can cross him any way, I bless myself every way. You are both sure, and will assist me. To the death, my lord. Let us to the great supper. Their cheer is the greater that I am subdued. <laughs> Would the cook were of my mind. Shall we go prove what's to be done? We'll wait upon your lordship. Exit. Act Two. For anybody out there who's watching, who just tuned, tuned in recently, I'm reading Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare. Oh, it's hard to tell sometimes how many people are watching. Okay. Let's take a sip of water and then do Act Two. Okay, Act Two. Enter Leonato, his brother, his wife, Hero, his daughter, and Beatrice, his niece, and a kinsman. Was not Count John here at supper? I saw him not. How tartly that gentleman looks. I never can see him, but I am heartburned an hour after. He is of a very melancholy disposition. He were an excellent man that were made just in the midway between him and Benedict. The one is too like an image and says nothing, and the other too like my lady's eldest son, evermore tattling. Then half, sore Bened then half Signor Benedict's tongue in Count John's mouth, and half Count John's melancholy in Signor Benedict's face. With a good leg and a good foot, uncle, and money in his purse, such a man would win any woman in the world if he could get her goodwill. By my troth, niece, thou wilt never get thee a husband if thou be so shrewd of thy tongue. In faith, she is too cursed. Too cursed is more than cursed. I shall lessen God's sending that way. For it is said, God sends a cursed cow short horns. But to a cow, too cursed, he sends none. So by being too cursed, God will send you no horns. Just. If he send me no husband, for the which blessing, I am at him upon my knees every morning and evening. Lord, I could not endure a husband with a beard in his face. I had rather lie in the woolen. You may lie upon a husband that hath no beard. Uh, you may light upon a husband that hath no beard. What should I do with him? Dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman? He that hath a beard is more than a youth. And he that hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me. And he that is less than a man, I am not for him. Therefore, I will even take sixpence in earnest of the barrowed and lead his apes into hell. 
Well then, go you into hell. <laughs> no, but to the gate. And there will the devil meet me like an old cuckold with horns on his head and say, Get you to heaven, Beatrice. Get you to heaven. Here's no place for you maids. So deliver I up my apes and away to St. Peter. For the heavens, he shews me where the bachelors sit, and there live we as merry as the day is long. Well, niece, I trust you will be ruled by your father. Yes, faith, it is my cousin's duty to make curtsy and say as it please you. But yet for all that, cousin, let him be a handsome fellow. Or else make another curtsy and say, Father, as it please me. Well, niece, I hope to see you one day fitted with a husband. Not till God make men of some other mortal than metal than earth would it not grieve a woman to be overmastered with a piece of valiant dust and to make an make account of her life to a clod of wayward marl. No, uncle, I'll none. Adam's sons are my brethren, and truly I hold it a sin to match in my kindred. Daughter, remember what I told you. If the prince do solicit you in that kind, you know your answer. The fault will be in the music, cousin, if you be not wooed in good time. If the prince be too important, tell him there is measure in everything, and so dance out the answer. For hear me here, a wooing, wedding, and repenting is as a scotch jig, a measure, and a sink pace. The first sweet is hot and hasty like a scotch jig, and full as fantastical. The wedding, mannerly, modest, as a measure, full of state and and. Oh, I'm not sure what that word is. A-U-N-C-H-N... Entree? And then comes repentance, and with his bad legs falls into the sink pace faster and faster, till he sinks into his grave. Leonato. Cousin, you apprehend passing shrewdly. I have a good eye, uncle. I can see a church by daylight. The revelers are entering, brother. Make good room. Lady, will you walk about with your friend? So you walk softly and look sweetly and say nothing. I am yours for the walk, and especially when I walk away, with me in your company. I may say so when I please, and when please you to say so, when I like your favor, for God defend the lute should be like the case. My visor is Philemon's roof, Within the house of within is within the house is love. Why then your visor should be thatched? Speak low if you speak love. Well, I would you did like me. Oh. Well, I would you did like me. So would not I for your own sake, for I have many ill qualities. Which is one? I say my prayers aloud. I love you the better. The hearers may cry, Amen. God, match me with a good dancer. Amen. And God keep him out of my sight when the dance is done. Answer Clark. No more words. The Clark is answered. I know you well enough. You are Signor Antonio. At a word, I am not. I know you by the waggling of your head. To tell you true, I counterfeit him. You could never do him so ill well unless you were the very man. Here's his dry hand, up and down. You are he, you are he. At a word, I am not. Come, come, do you think I do not know you by your excellent wit? Can virtue hide itself and go too? Mom, you are he, graces will appear, and there's an end. Will you not tell me who told you so? No, you shall pardon me. Nor will you not tell me who you are? Not now that I was disdainful, and that I had my good wit out of the hundred merry tales. Well, this was Signor Benedict that said so. What's he? I'm sure you know him well enough. Not I, believe me. Did he never make you laugh? I pray you, what is he? Why, he is the prince's jester, a very dull fool, only his gift is, in deviling impossible slanders, none but libertines delight in him, and the commentation is not in his wit, but in his villainy for he both pleaseth men and angers them, and then they laugh at him and beat him. I am sure he is in the fleet. I would he have boarded me. When I know the gentleman, I'll tell him what you say. Do, do, 
He'll but break a comparison or two on me, which peradventure, not marked, or not laughed at, strikes him into melancholy, and then there's a partridge wing saved, for the fool will eat no supper that night. Oh, we must follow the leaders, in every good thing. Nay, if they lead to any ill, I will leave them at the next turning. Music for the dance begins. Sure, my brother is amorous on Hero, and hath withdrawn her father to break with him about it. The ladies follow her, and but one visor remains. And that is Claudio. I know him by his bearing. Are you not Signor Benedict? You know me well? I am he? Signor, you are very near my brother in his love. He is enamored on Hero. I pray you, dissuade him. From her, she is no equal for his birth. You may do the part of an honest man in it. How know you he loves her? I heard him swear his affection. So did I, too, and he swore he would marry her tonight. Come, let us to the banquet. Thus answer I, in name of Benedict, but hear these ill news with the ears of Claudio. To certain so, the prince woos for himself. Friendship is constant in all things, save in the office and affairs of love. Therefore, all hearts in love use their own tongues. Let every eye negotiate for itself, and trust no agent. For beauty is a witch, against whose charms faith melteth into blood. This is an accident of our proof, which I mistrusted not. Farewell, therefore, hero. Count Claudio? Yea, the same. Come, will you go with me? Whither? Even to the next willow, about your own business, Count. What fashion will you wear? What, what fashion will you wear the garland off? About your neck like a usurous chain? Or under your arms like a lieutenant's scarf? You must wear it one way, for the prince hath got your hero. I wish him joy of her. Why, that's spoken like an honest drover, so they sell bullocks. But did you think the prince would have served you thus? I pray you, leave me. How oh, no, you'd strike like the blind man. T'was the boy that stole your meat, and you'll beat the post. If it will not be, I'll leave you. Alas, poor hurt fowl. Now will he creep into sedges, but that my lady Beatrice should know me and not know me. A prince's fool! Ha! It may be I go under that title, because I am merry. Yea, but so I am apt to do myself wrong. I am not so reputed. It is the base, the bitter disposition of Beatrice that's put the world into her person, and so gives me out. Well, I'll be revenged as I may. Enter the prince. Now, senor, where's the count? Did you see him? Troth, my lord, I have played the part of Lady Fame. I found him here as melancholy as a lodge in a warren. I told him, and I think told him true, that your grace had got the will of this young lady, and I offered him my company to a willow tree, either to make him a garland, as being forsaken, or to bind him a rod, as being worthy to be whipped. To be whipped? What's his fault? The flat transgression of a schoolboy, who being overjoyed with finding a bird's nest, shews it his companion, and he steals it. Wilt thou make a trust? A transgression? The transgression is in the stealer. Yet it had not been amiss. The rod had been made, and the garland too, for the garland he might have worn himself, and the rod he might have bestowed on you, who, as I take it, have stolen his bird's nest. I will but teach them to sing and restore them to the owner. If their singing answer your saying, by my faith you say honestly. The Lady Beatrice hath a quarrel to you, the gentleman that danced with her told her she is much wronged by you. Oh, she misused me past the endurance of a block. An oath but with one green leaf on it would have answered her. My very visor being so assumed, being, being to assume life and scold with her. She told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was the prince's jester. And that I was duller than a great thaw, huddling jest upon jest with such impossible convenience upon me. that. I stood like a man in a mark with a whole army shooting at me. She speaks poniards, and every word stabs. 
If her breath were as terrible as terminations, there were no living near her. She would infect to the North Star. I would not marry her, though she were endowed with all that Adam had left him before he transgressed. She would have made Hercules have turned spit. Yea, and have cleft his club to make the fire too. Come, talk, talk not of her. You shall find her the infernal, aiding good apparel. I would to God some scholar would conjure her. For certainly while she is here, a man may live as quiet in hell as in a sanctuary, and people sin upon purpose, because they would go thither to in, to indeed, uh, thither. So indeed all disquiet, horror, and perturbation follows her. Enter Claudio and Beatrice, Leonato and Hero. Hero. Look, here she comes. Will your grace command me to any service? To the ends of the, to the world's end. I will go on the slightest errand, now to the antipodes that you can devise to send me on. I will fetch you a toothpicker now from the furthest inch of Asia. Bring you the length of Prester John's foot. Fetch you a hair off the great champ's beard. Do you embassage to the pygmies, rather than hold three words conference with this harpy? You have no employment for me. None but to desire your good company. Oh, God, sir, here's a dish I love not. I cannot endure this lady tongue. Exit Benedict. Come, lady, come. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Indeed, my lord, he lent it me a while, and I gave him use for it. A double heart for a single one. Mary once before he won it of me with false dice, therefore your grace may well say, I have lost it. You have put him down, lady. You have put him down. So I would not he should do me, my lord, lest I should prove the mother of fools. I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. Why now? Why how now, Count? Wherefore are you sad? Not sad, my lord. How then? Sick? Neither, my lord. The Count is neither sad, nor sick, nor merry, nor well, but civil, Count. Civil as an orange, and something of a jealous complexion. In faith, lady, I think your blazon to be true. Though I'll be sworn, if he be so, his conceit is false. Here, Claudio, I have wooed in thy name, and fair hero is one. I have broke with her father, and his good will obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Count, take of me my daughter, and with her my fortunes. His grace hath made the match, and all grace say amen to it. Speak, Count, tis your cue. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. I were but little happy if I could say how much. Lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I give away myself for you, and do it upon the exchange, and dote upon the exchange. Speak, cousin, or if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss and let him not speak, and let him let not him speak neither. In faith, lady, you have a merry heart. Yea, my lord, I thank it. Poor fool, it keeps on the windy side of care. My cousin tells him in his ear that he is in my heart. And so she doth, con and so she doth cousin. Good lord, for alliance. Thus goes every one to the world but I. And I am sunburned. I may sit in a corner and cry, hey ho, for a husband. Lady Beatrice, I will get you one. I would rather have one of your father's getting, hath your grace ne'er a brother like you. Your father got excellent husbands if a maid could come by them. Will you have me? Lady. No, my lord. Unless I might have another for working days, your grace is too costly to wear every day. But I beseech your grace, pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth and no matter. Your silence most offends me. And to be merry best becomes you. For out of question you were born in a merry hour. No, sure, my lord, my mother cried. 
that then there was a star danced, and under that was I born. Cousins, God give you joy. Niece, will you look to those things I told you of? I cry you mercy, uncle, and by your grace's pardon. By my troth, a pleasant spirited lady. There's little of the melancholy element in her, my lord. She is never sad, but when she sleeps, and not even and not ever sad then, for I have heard my daughter say she hath oft dreamt of unhappiness and waked herself with laughing. She cannot endure to hear talk of a husband. Oh, by no means. She mocks all her wooers out of suit. She were an excellent wife for Benedict. Oh, Lord, my Lord, if they were but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. Count Claudio, when mean you to go to church? Tomorrow, my Lord, time goes on crutches till love have all his rights. Not till Monday, my dear son, which is hence a just seven night, and a time too brief, too, to have all things answer mine. Come, you shake the head at so long a breathing, but I warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go dully by us. I will, in the interim, undertake one of Hercules' labors, which is to bring Signor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection the one with the other. I would fain have it a match. I would fain have it a match, and I doubt not but to fashion it. If you three will but minister such assistance as I shall give you direction. My lord, I am for you, though it cost me ten nights' watchings. And I, my lord, and you too, gentle hero. I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. And Benedict is not the unhopefulest husband that I know. Thus far can I praise him. He is of a noble strain, of approved valor and confirmed honesty, I will teach you how to humor your cousin, that she shall fall in love with Benedict, and I, with you two help, with your two helps, will so practice on Benedict, that in despite of his quick wit and his queasy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. If we can do this, Cupid is no longer an archer. His glory shall be ours, for we are the only love gods. Go in with me, and I will tell you my drift. Exit. Enter Prince John, or Count John, and Braccio. It is so. The Count Claudio shall marry the daughter of Leonato. Yea, my lord, but I can cross it. Any bar, any cross, <laughs> any impediment will be medicinable to me. I'm sick in displeasure to him, and whatsoever comes athwart his affection ranges evenly with mine. How canst thou cross this marriage? Not honestly, my lord, but so covertly that no dishonesty shall appear in me. Show me briefly how. I think I told your lordship a year since how much I am in the favor of Margaret, the waiting gentlewoman to Hero. I remember. I can at any unseasonable instant of the night appoint her to look out at her lady's chamber window. What life is in that to be the death of this marriage? The poison of that lies in you to temper. Go you to the prince, your brother, spare not to him. Tell him, spare not to tell him that he hath wronged his honor in marrying the renowned Claudio, whose estimation do you mightily hold up to a contaminated stale, such a one as hero. What proof shall I make of that? Proof enough? To misuse the prince, to vex Claudio, to undo Hero, and kill Leonato. Look ye for any other issue? Only to despite them, I will endeavor anything. Go then, find me a meet hour to draw on Pedro and the Count Claudio alone. Tell them that you know that Hero loves me. Intend a kind of zeal both to the prince and Claudio, as in a love of your brother's honor, who hath made this match? and his friend's reputation, who is thus like to be cousin with the semblance of a maid, that you have discovered thus. They will scarcely believe this without trial. Offer them instances which shall bear no less likelihood. 
than to see me at her chamber window, hear me call Margaret Hero, hear Margaret term me Claudio, and bring them to see this the very night before the intended wedding. For in the meantime, I will so fashion the matter that Hero shall be absent, and there shall appear such seeming truths of Hero's disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance, and all the preparation overthrown. Grow this to what adverse issue it can, I will put it in practice. Be cunning in the working this, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. Be thou constant in the accusation, and my cunning shall not shame me. I will presently go learn their day of marriage. Exit. Enter Benedict. Boy, senor, in my chamber window lies a book. Bring it hither to me in the orchard. I am here already, sir. Uh, I am here already, sir. Exit boy. I know that, but I would have thee hence and here again. I do much wonder that one man seen, how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will after he hath laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. And such a man is Claudia. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife, and now had he rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I have known when he would have walked ten miles afoot to see a good armor. And now will he lie awake, lie ten nights awake, carving the fashion of a new doublet. He was wont to speak plain and to the purpose, like an honest man and a soldier. And now, as he turned orthography, his words are a very fantastical banquet. Just so many strange dishes, may I be so converted? And see with these eyes, I cannot tell. I think not. I will not be sworn, but love may transform me to an oyster, but I'll take my oath on it till he hath made an oyster of me. He shall never make me such a fool. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she shall be. That's certain. Wife or I'll not. Virtuous or I'll never cheapen her. Fair or I'll never look on her. Mild or come not near me. Noble or not for an angel. Of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair shall be of what color it please God. The prince and monsieur love. I will hide me in the arbor. Enter prince Leonardo Claudio and Jack Wilson. Jack Wilson. Okay. Come, shall we hear this music? Yea, my good lord, how still the evening is, as hushed on purpose to grace harmony. See you where Benedict hath hid himself. Oh, very well, my lord. The music ended. We'll fit the kind fox. We'll fit the kid fox with a pennyworth. Come on, Balthazar, we'll hear that song again. Oh, good, my lord, tax not so bad a voice to slander music any more than once. It is the witness still of excellency to slander music any more than once. It is the witness still of excellency to put a strange face on his own perfection. I pray thee sing, and let me woo no, woe no more. Because you talk of wooing, I will sing, since many a wooer doth commence his suit to to her he thinks not worthy, yet he woos, yet will he swear he loves. Nay, pray thee come, or if thou wilt hold no longer argument, do it in notes. Or if, thou, or if thou wilt hold longer argument, do it in notes. Note this before my notes, there's not a note of mine that's worth the noting. Why, these are very crotchets that he speaks. Note notes for sooth and nothing. Now divine air, now is his soul ravished. Is it not strange that sheep's guts should hail souls out of men's bodies? Well, a horn for my money when all's done. Sigh no more, ladies, sigh no more. When men were deceivers ever, one foot in sea and one on shore, 
to one thing constant never. Then sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe into hey, nonny, nonny. Sing no more ditties, sing no more of dumps so dull and heavy. The fraud of men were ever so, since summer first was levy. Then sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe into hey, nonny, nonny. By my troth, a good song, and an ill singer, my lord, Ah, no, no, faith, thou singst well enough for a shift. And he had been a dog that should have howled thus, they would have hanged him. And I pray God his bad voice bode no mischief. I had as least, I had as life have heard the night raven come up plagues could have come after it. Eh, hey, Mary, dost thou hear, Balthazar? I pray thee, get us some excellent music, for tomorrow night we would have it at the Lady Hero's chamber window. The best I can, my lord. Exit Balthazar. Do so. Farewell. Come hither, Leonato. What was it you told me of today? That your niece Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedict? Oh, I stalk on, stalk on. The foul, the foul sits. I did never think that lady would have loved any man. No, nor I neither. But most wonderful that she should so dote on Signor Benedict, whom she hath in all outward behavior seemed ever to abhor. Is it possible? Sits the wind in that corner? By my troth, my lord, I cannot tell what to think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged affection it is past the infinite of thought. Maybe she doth but counterfeit. Faith, like enough. Oh, God, counterfeit! There was never a counterfeit of passion came so near the life of passion as she discovers it. Why, what effects of passion shows she? Bait the hook well, this fish will bite. <laughs> what effects, my lord? She will fit you? You heard my daughter tell you how. She did indeed. How, how, I pray you. You amaze me. I would have thought her spirit had been invincible against all assaults of affection. I would have sworn it had, my lord, especially against Benedict. I should think this a gull, but that the white-bearded fellow speaks it. Knavery cannot s sure hide himself in such reverence. He hath taken the infection. Hold it up! Hath she made her affection known to Benedict? No and swears she never will. That's her torment. Tis true indeed. So your daughter says, Shall I, says she, that have so oft encountered him with scorn write to him, that I love him? This says she now, when she is beginning to write to him, for she'll be up twenty times a night, and there will she sit in her smock till she have writ a sheet of paper. My daughter tells us all. Now you talk of a sheet of paper. I remember a pretty jest your daughter told us of. Oh, when she had writ it, and was reading it over, she found Benedict and Beatrice between the sheet. That, oh, she tore the letter in a thousand halfpence, railed at herself, that she should be so immodest to write to one that she knew would flout her. I measure him, says she, by my own spirit, for I should flout him if he writ to me. Yea, though I love him, I should. And then down upon her knees she falls, weeps, sobs beats her heart, tears her hair, prays, curses, oh, sweet Benedict, God, give me patience. She doth indeed. My daughter says so, and the ecstasy hath so much overborne her that my daughter is sometime I heard she will do a desperate outrage, somehow, sometime I feared she will do a desperate outrage to herself. It is very true. It were good that Benedict knew of it by some other, if she will not discover it. To what end he would but make a sport of it, and torment the poor lady worse? And he should. It were an alms to hang him. She is an excellent sweet lady, and out of all suspi all suspicion, she is virtuous, and she is exceeding wife, in everything but in loving Benedict. Oh, my lord, wisdom and bl 
wisdom and blood combating in so tender a body. We have ten proofs to one that blood hath the victory. I am sorry for her, as I have just caused being her uncle and her guardian. I would she had bestowed this dotage on me. I would have dashed all other respects and made her here and made her half myself. I pray you, tell Benedict of it and hear what he will say. Word good, think you. Hero thinks surely she will die, for she says she will die if he loves her not, and she will die ere she make her love known, and she will die if he woo her, rather than she will bait one breath of her accustomed crossin crossinness. She doth well if she should make tender of her love. Tis very possible he'll scorn it, for the man, as you know all, has a contemptible spirit. He is a very proper man. She hath indeed a good outward happiness. For God, and in my mind, my and in my mind, very wife. He doth indeed show some sparks that are like wit. And I take him to be valiant, as Hector, I assure you, and in the managing of quarrels, you may see he is wife. For either Oh, I'm not sure what that word is. A U O Y D E S. For either he oids them with great discretion, or undertakes them with a Christian-like fear. If he do fear God, a must necessarily keep peace. If he break the peace, he ought to enter into a quarrel with fear and trembling. And so will he do, for the man doth fear God, howsoever it seems not in him, by some large jests here, large jests he will make. Well, I am sorry for your niece. Shall we go see Benedict and tell him of her love? Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. Well, we will hear further of it by your daughter. Let it cool a while. I love Benedict well, and I could wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy to have so good a lady. My lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. If he do not dote on her upon this, I will never trust my expectation. Let there be the same net spread for her, and that must your daughter and her gentlewoman carry. The sport will be when they hold one an opinion of another's dotage, and no such matter. That's the scene that I would see, which will be merely a dumb show. Let us send her to call him into dinner. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have the full bent. Love me. <laughs> Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that she will rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. Tis a truth. I can bear them witness. And virtuous, tis so. I cannot reprove it. And wife, wise, but for loving me. By my troth, it is no addition to her wit, nor no great argument of her folly. But I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I've railed so long against marriage. But doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humor? No. The world must be peopled. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Here comes Beatrice. By this day she's a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. Enter Beatrice. Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. Fair Beatrice, I thank you for your pains. 
I took no more pains for those thanks than you take pains to thank me. If it had been painful, I would not have come. You take pleasure, then, in the message? Yea, just so much as you may take upon a knife's point and choke a doll withal. You have no stomach, senor. Fare you well. <sighs> Against my will, I am sent to bid you come into dinner. There's a double meaning in that. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much as to say any pains that I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity of her, I am a villain. If I do not love her, I am a Jew. I will go get her picture. Exit. End of Act Two. Let's see, how many pages do we have left? Fourteen pages left. How long is Act Three? Okay, I think I'm going to do this in installments. So that was Acts One and Two of Much Ado About Nothing, and theoretically, this is also being uh, recorded for YouTube on my on a different camera. Um, so if that works out. I'll be able to post this up on YouTube, and then I'll have the different installments sometime over the next couple weeks. <laughs> so, thank you very much for watching, and for tuning in if you tune into the replay. And we will continue with Much Ado About Nothing in a future broadcast. Thank you.